on smidal fluid leak management, a topic that obviously isn't anyone's favorite, but nevertheless very much important. So, um, you know, there are obviously different dural issues. There's the planned durotomy, which um, is, is something that you do in the context of intradural pathology. Um, very different animal than the iatrogenic durotomy that you're not planning to do, but a lot of the same principles apply. And so a lot of sort of what, what I you know think of when I have an unplanned durotomy is, is um, the same principles and fundamentals that we learned when we were trying to, to, to close planned durotomies. Um, and this is just a, a slide of one of our past fellows, Ryan Hole, and he got, I don't know, for whatever reason during his rotation, we had a bunch of intradural stuff, and he got really good at, at closing the dura, and uh, he never done it before. He's an orthopedic postgraduate fellow, but as you can see, he got really good at, at closing the dura. So unplanned durotomy, obviously a very different animal. It's seldom that midline opening. It's usually in a very unopportune spot under the lamina or by the sleeve or out in the, the lateral gutter or something to that effect. So um, in terms of incidents, how frequently how frequently it occurs, you know, it's a difficult thing, I think, because uh, it's not always reported. And like many complications in surgery, there's a huge um, variance in what you see in the literature. But it is pretty common. Um, and the lowest incidence that I could find is 1%, but there are some studies that suggest it's up to 17%, which I think, again, this is probably a fairly significant over-exaggeration. Um, but, you know, it's probably somewhere in the, the lower single digits. Um, the best study that you can find, or at least that I could find, um, last time I did a, a literature review, which was about a year ago, was this uh, prospective study out of the United Kingdom, which obviously, you know, they have a national healthcare system. So it's a little easier to, to follow things like this with some granularity at a health-based level. Um, and they looked at almost 1,600 cases, 14 different hospitals. Um, and these are the numbers that they came away with. Again, I think this is pretty high, um, but 3.5% uh, for, for discectomy, 8.5% um, for stenosis surgery. Uh, and then 13.2% for revision discectomy. And there's a wide variation amongst surgeons. So these numbers do seem high to me. I think that the almost, you know, the significant change between primary and revision discectomy, though, is, is obviously a pattern that anybody that does revision work, um, you know, can appreciate. Uh, because these data are so variable, I think it's a good idea for the fellows, you know, when they start going out into practice, you'll have to be collecting your cases for boards preparation anyways. Um, as you guys know, I kind of keep a pretty, um, pretty detailed case log. And I think it's a good idea to do that for complications as well. And so, you know, a year or two or three in when you've got a couple hundred um, decompressions, you can say, well, this is my rate of spinal fluid leakage. You don't have to quote, you know, 8% or whatever that the data suggests, because that may be pretty far away from your own data. And that way you can say, listen, the risk is about, you know, one and a half percent or 2%. And you can say that with, um, you know, with good fidelity and, and without being uh, dishonest. And it's also probably a good idea to keep um, track of your own data because there is some evidence that the payers actually like have AI that looks at uh, op reports to look for like things like durotomy um, and, and they have created the kind of some interesting instruments. They're going to be tracking your data. And so it's always good for you to track your own data. OK, so what are the risk factors uh, for a durotomy? And, and this is based off a, a multivariable logistic regression. A lot of it is pretty straightforward. So increased surgical duration, maybe that's a risk factor. It could be a chicken or you know before the egg. Um, because certainly if you have a durotomy, that's going to increase the time of your surgery. So I don't think that the surgical duration is a significant one. However, age definitely plays an impact to it. Um, we know from like a lot of cranial neurosurgery, when you're taking the bone flap off the skull, oftentimes in older folks, the dura is like stuck to it because the dura just gets a lot finer um, and less malleable as folks age. And I think the same thing is true, although to a lesser extent with the spinal dura, the spinal dura is a little bit more robust, but certainly as folks age, it can become a lot more uh, friable and, and easier to, to tear. Revision, I think, is probably um, the number one risk factor just because you're dealing with so much scar and the epidural plane is no longer 
um, you know, a, a clean dissection plane. And then cases that start after 4 p.m. is kind of an interesting one. Um, you can come to your own conclusions there, but I think that that's probably a real risk factor as well. So I would say revision number one, uh, and then age is probably the, the second biggest thing that leads to it. Um, not risk factors, doesn't matter if you're neuro or ortho. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if you've got a resident assisting you um, or if it's a fellow and they've done studies to look at that. Um, how many years you've been in training doesn't seem to to impact it. And likewise, you know, whether it's a larger patient doesn't seem to, to affect it. I, I wonder if it's underpowered for that last point. I mean, especially if you're doing MIS decompressions, if you've got a four centimeter tube versus like a seven or eight centimeter tube, your dexterity is just so much different. So if it were significantly powered, my guess is that you would probably find a difference with BMI. Um, so, you know, I think we often think about durotomy as a minor complication. And certainly if you do enough cases, you're gonna have durotomies. In the grand scheme of things, I suppose it is minor, but it does have significant ramifications in the medical legal landscape. So, um, they did this review of you know about 150 malpractice cases uh, involved um and that durotomy was like the second most frequent named uh issue that was brought up in those medical legal cases so definitely something that the the, the pi folks are, are tuned into even though it's a you know not um you know malpractice by any means it's just nevertheless something that's brought up in the legal sphere so okay what are the consequences so headache uh, obviously, that's the most clinically salient, um, but it does significantly increase the risk of infection and meningitis, so serious infection, not just a wound infection. Um, it also is associated with new onset neurologic deficits. Uh, and then even if you don't have a wound leak, it can cause a pseudomeningocele, which can create its own set of uh, challenges in the patient's recovery. Um, it does have a significant uh, impact on uh, PROMs, primarily in the short term. Um, but it has effects on EQ5D and, and uh, SF36. Um, obviously, leads to significant patient dissatisfaction. I mean, having a you know outpatient discectomy is dramatically different than having an outpatient discectomy that turns into a you know two three night admission because you've got to lay the patient flat and um, you know maybe even place a smile drain. Who knows? Um, that incidentally, the the one positive consequence of that, however, is I think. The Laser Spine Institute's downfall was actually that the Hulk got a CSF leak and then they mismanaged it and then he sued him for like $50 million or something like that. And then like a couple of days later, they they shuttered the doors. So a uh, little side story. Uh, and then obviously, if you have a durotomy, it's going to increase the cost of that uh, encounter uh, fairly dramatically. Increases length of stay, increases uh, antibiotic requirement, and oftentimes will lead to revision surgery, which is probably the biggest uh, cost add. Um, so there was a, st a study that looked at this um, using the Medicare insurance database. Um, so about 67% increase in the cost in the encounter, about $4,000 uh, upon uh, durotomy. Um, the Pearl database, which has a little bit more granularity, it's from the payer side, suggests it's more like a $10,000 increase, about 120% higher. Um, and obviously, it leads to significant readmission, more than twice as, as much, and uh, longer hospitalization. So all those things contribute to cost significantly. Okay, so that's kind of the, the backdrop. I, I think the more important thing you know, for us is when it happens, what do you do? So it's going to happen, like we said, there's data that suggests it's going to happen regardless of whether you're ortho or neuro. It's going to happen whether it's your first year of practice or your 10 years into practice, and it's going to happen whether or not you're in a training institution. So it's just, it's going to happen. And it's a technically minor complication, but can have huge um, ramifications in terms of uh, satisfaction, proms, and, and obviously cost. So the management when it does happen is, is critical. Um, and um, I think the most important thing is not to panic, you know, not to freak out. It's just take a deep breath and realize that your best opportunity to solve the problem that just occurred is at, you know, this index surgery. So um, you're not a loser who was husky growing up and mother always loved your sister more. I think that, that was a joke I wrote last year, but it doesn't sound right now. So don't panic, take a breath. Um, don't, pretend, <laughs> don't pretend it didn't happen. So I think, you know, there could be 
a natural inclination to just kind of say, oh, well, maybe it's some synovial fluid or put a piece of gel foam over it or just kind of pretend it's not there and, and move forward. I think you have to take the opposite approach. If you're concerned that there is a CSF leak, you have to actually explore and um, you're kind of guilty until proven innocent. So make sure that there's not a CSF leak before you blow it off. Don't just cover it up with something. So, okay, so now you, you have kind of established that there is CSF leak. You have to kind of temporarily cover it. I usually will just put a little patty over it and maybe some surge flow just to kind of stop it from leaking. Take a deep breath, collect yourself. Just say something out, out loud to yourself sometimes, whatever, but just remind yourself that this is your opportunity to fix it. Uh, and don't dwell on the fact that you caused the problem. We'll be plenty of time later. Just focus on fixing it. So the first thing I think in management, like the first rule is that there's no substitute for a good primary closure, meaning actually bringing the two leaves of the torn dura together when possible. The second rule, there's no substitute for a good primary. Third rule, no substitute for a good primary. So you really got to get that primary closure to the extent that you can. So um, you want to set yourself up for success. I think, you know, the primary goal of the surgery was probably decompression or something else, but the primary, you have to kind of reset and make the primary goal of what you're doing to close the leak. And that means that you have to maybe expand the incision, expand the bony removal. For me, oftentimes it means if it's a bad one, I have to take the tube out. I have to do a midline takedown. I mean, it dramatically changes the operation, but to get a good um, repair, that's very much necessary. Um, so do what you have to, to set yourself up for su success. And that often means widen your exposure to sort of changing the neighbor nature of the operation, at least temporarily. Um, if you don't have the scope ready, get it ready. Um, the micro instruments are often, you know, very critical. So, you know, whether you have your Castro Viejo or there's a special, like a special scissors you like or not push or whatever it is that, that you're most uh, comfortable with, as I mentioned, sometimes you can repair MIS, um, uh, but oftentimes you'll have to convert. If it's a small leak, I have this like um, bariatric needle driver that I can put down the MIS tube. So if it's like on the, you know, the dorsal surface of the dura, usually you can do it. Um, but if it's in the, you know, the nerve sleeve or in the axilla, it's really hard to do through a tube just because it's hard to have the degrees of freedom with your wrist to get a proper stitch. Um, so whatever it is that's going to work best for you, know it ahead of time, maybe have a cart or... Um, you know, at least a card prepared for you, you know, fellows and you go to your institution, like this is my dural repair card and it's, you know, Duragen, Duraceal, these needle drivers, these stitches, et cetera. Um, so there's some debate about what the best suture is. Um, I actually probably don't follow most of the recommendations in the literature, at least, but most people, and I'll tell you why, but most people will use a 4.0, uh, 5.0 or even 6.0, um, either Gore-Tex or Proline, because um, those are non-absorbable sutures. Um, the important thing is you don't want the suture to be larger than the stitch, because if you do that, it's going to have a um, potential space around the stitch. And so you can actually have CSF leak through the suture line. Um, most of those smaller sutures are not going to have that problem, but just something to keep in mind. Um, Gore-Tex and Perlene are the strongest. I think 6.0 is just kind of, it's so small, it's hard to handle. And 4.0 seems a, a little big. So I'm usually a 5.0 um, personally. Uh, and even though Gore-Tex and Perlene are uh, stronger, I actually uh, prefer uh, Silk, um, which is a result of, you know, spending a lot of hundreds of hours with this guy, Paul McCormick, who did all the intradural tumors at um, Columbia, where I was a resident. And so and he was closing the dura couple times a week and, and that's kind of who I learned from and the nice thing about silk even though it's not as strong and, and um, non-resorbable as proline and Gore-Tex is it just handles really well uh, it's really smooth it's easy to tie down a, a, a deep um, hole so the handling properties are really nice and there's two different at least at green we've got like two different needle configurations one that's a little bit smaller and for like a, a really high angle throw um, and, uh, and so I like silk. It's just because it's such an easy thing to handle. Yes, it's not as strong as, as Gore-Tex, but usually it's not the, the stitch that breaks. If you have, you know, a durotomy reopen, I've never seen that happen. It's really more about getting a good closure. So whatever material is going to allow you to do that, I think is the most important, most important thing. 
Um, so, and then there are sealants, as you know. So say you have a durotomy and you throw a couple stitches and you have like the perfect closure. Um, you still are probably gonna wanna augment that with a sealant. Um, so there is a review that looks at the efficacy of these uh, and the different strategies. Everybody kind of has their own strategy, you know, uh, how they like to apply it. Um, but the most common uh, technique that this study found was a combination of, you know, primary closure with stitches and then a patch or a graft and then sealant. Um, some folks would do a primary closure uh, and then just a patch or a graft. Um, but uh, it did whether or not they used sealant as opposed to just a primary closure, it didn't significantly reduce the rate of CSF leak compared to just the primary closure. I think it's a hard thing to just kind of study with any real efficacy because you don't know the, the guys that use sealant are probably different individuals and maybe they were better at their primary closure. Or they're maybe the ones that didn't use sealant or better at their primary closure. So it's not the cleanest study, um, but there's no, I guess, hard evidence that sealants make a difference, but intuitively it does seem to, to improve, um, or at least, uh, you know, empirically in, in my hand, it does seem to improve the situation. Um, and uh, whether or not you use sealant doesn't have any impact on deficit or um, infection. There is a, a case report or maybe two case reports of um, the sealants expanding like Duracell and then causing neurologic issue. Um, I've never seen that in practice, but I know that there is a case report or two of that happening in the cervical spine. I think it's important that you don't just go crazy with it and add like a ton of sealant. You know, you really just want to get sort of around the suture line uh, and around the, the periphery of your, your durgen or your graft if you do use it. Um, so like... The technique, I've heard everything under the sun. I mean, some people like to put in a piece of durgen and then sealant and then another piece of durgen. Some people like to do sealant and then durgen, durgen, then sealant. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. I don't know that there's one that's better than the other. Um, my preferred technique is to make, make my primary closure, um, then put the durgen over the closure and then use the sealant around the periphery of the um, the graft um, or the plug. And, and that kind of seems to be a good, um, I don't know, process for me. I don't love putting the sealant right on the suture line. Um, there, and the concern there would be if it gets into like the inner digitations of the closure that it may preclude the dura from actually healing. No evidence for that. It's just something I've sort of heard incidentally. So that's why I don't like to apply it right to the line. But doing so, I think, is, is reasonable as well. So figure out what works best for you, I guess, is, is the story. Um, there were some interest in, in clips. I, I think this has largely fallen out of favor. Um, but uh, for a while, there was, at least in neurosurgery, a lot of people were trying to use clips to close these things. The problem is getting the clip on. So the dural edges for a lot of iatrogenic durotomies, particularly if it was created by like a kerosene, um, they're not going to be directly opposed. And so getting a clip on there is pretty tough. So there was some interest in that for a while, but not really any longer. Um, the the one new instrument that I think is really nice, I think what they invented at Duke is um, God, it's Durastat, which is, I think I have a slide on that. So I won't get into it too much. Maybe I don't actually. So I'll create a slide for next year, but Durastat is this device that um, uh, creates basically the really sharp angle down in a deep hole. And so you can just get it into the dural defect and then fire it, it's almost like a gun and spring loaded and it just shoots the needle um, into um, the dural defect so you can tie it. The nice thing about it is in dark, you know, long deep holes, it allows you to throw like 180 degree stitch. So that is, I think, been a game changer. It's extremely expensive. It's like eight hundred dollars for each stitch, um, or each you know set of stitches. Um, but that is is a really nice uh, adjunct for those difficult to repair surgical um, uh, or durotomies. Whereas I think clips don't really help much at all. Okay, so uh, drain. This is something I think is actually really important, um, but uh, also potentially problematic. So. I think leaving a drain is, is really critical for a couple of reasons, um, but it can also create problems. So obviously when you have a drain in the subfascial compartment of an area where you have a durotomy, it cannot be on compression. 
if it's on compression, it'll pull CSF leak. It'll pull CSF, which can cause two things. One, if there's a pressure gradient across the leak, it's going to continue um, to flow and not heal, which is obvious. But two, it can cause a whole slew of complications. You can have a subdural hematoma, um, which can be obviously devastating. So I think drains are critically important, but obviously it can't be under compression. Um, as all the fellows know, we always write, do not compress all over the drain. So if a nurse on the floor you know, misses the order, just has a reflex tendency to compress it, they'll see do not compress written there. So, okay, so you place the drain subfascial, you write do not compress on the drain. Um, so why is it valuable? Well, it gives you information about the leak. So say you've got somebody that you, um, you know, had a derotomy, you repaired it, get a decent repair, they're lying flat for 24 hours after the, the surgery. And then um, you get them up and the drain's on gravity and it hasn't been putting anything out. But after they get up with physical therapy, you know, puts out 100 cc's of pink fluid. Well, then you'll know that there is still ongoing leakage. You can you can clamp it, um, which I often. March, honey, I'm just giving a talk. Can you keep watching the cartoon? I'll be there in just 10 minutes, OK? OK, sorry about that. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, she's watching The Incredibles. It's Melanie's OR day, so I'm kind of, yeah, Mondays are crazy. So, okay, so um, so obviously you have it on gravity. You can clamp it. The, the, the nice thing about clamping it is that, you know, it will, if there is a CSF in the surgical bed, it'll pressurize, and then there's no flow of fluid, so it allows you to pressurize. Um, but it also gives you information and it protects against this phenomenon of the, the one-way valve. So what can happen is if you've got sort of a partially repaired uh, durotomy, fluid can get out, but it can't get back in. And so if that happens, say every time they've all solve or whatever, some more fluid goes out, it can create a pressurized fluid collection that can create, you know, a lot of neurologic issues, pain, and sometimes deficit. So if you have that drain even if it's clamped if they start to develop radiculopathy from that fluid collection from that one-way valve you can at least drain it off um, while you're probably taking them back to the or so drain is important just don't put it under suction if when you rotate with me you'll learn all the idiosyncrasies of my you know how, how i manage the drain which a lot of it is not evidence-based but um this is that one way valve effect where csf comes out but can't get back into the fecal sac and so it can build up and pressurize uh, and then the flat protocol. So uh, I, you know, it depends on the leak. I think how long folks have to stay flat um, for an intended durotomy, like say somebody had a tumor, if they had surgery on Monday, I'll keep them flat Monday evening, all day, Tuesday, and then I'll start to get them up on Wednesday. So I don't know if you want to call that 36 hours or 48 hours, but usually somewhere in that, um, in that neighborhood, if it's a bad leak and I can't get a, a proper repair, or if it's a revision repair because the first attempt failed, then I'll usually keep them flat for an entire additional day. So say they had surgery on Monday, then I'm keeping flat Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and try to get them up on Thursday. So it's not a one size fits all um, sort of approach in terms of the, the timing. I think you have to use your best judgment and also see how the patient is doing symptomatically. The reason it's important to have somebody flat is that um, it takes the pressure of the water column off of the repair site, which um, is, is critical. So I know that s some folks, when it's in the cervical spine, will sit people up with the assumption that that will reduce, you know, like that'll reduce the pressure of the water column. But the the fluid level of the water column is is like way up in the brain. It's not in the neck. Uh, obviously, you don't drain all of the fluid out of your ventricles. So I think regardless of where the leak is, um, unless it's in like the lateral ventricle, you, you have to, um, to lie them flat to reduce the pressure of that water column. And these are just some images that kind of depict that. So one place with lumbar drain. So I think it's probably better to be aggressive with lumbar drains. I do think it makes a huge impact in the likelihood of success. Um, oftentimes there is a reticence to do so upfront because you haven't consented the patient for it and you're still hopeful that your primary leak will heal. So unless it's a bad situation, I seldom do it up front. But I think if you're going back for a revision, you really just want, even though it's so painful to take somebody back for a complication, you really want it to be a one and done revision, meaning you want to fix it when you go back for that revision. So in that context, you've already failed once. I think for most revisions, it makes sense to do so. It is the simplest procedure you could possibly do. I mean, it's just point and shoot, particularly if you've got fluoroscopy. 
So um, if I'm doing a lumbar drain, even for like NPH or something like that, and you guys just come in and do it with me so you learn how to do it and you don't have to ask any of your colleagues when you're out in practice. Um, but it's super easy. If you're asking yourself whether or not you need to do so, uh, you probably have to do it. Uh, if you're closing and you're pretty much positive that you haven't gotten a, a, a proper repair, I mean, you could still see some CSF leakage, but you don't feel like you can do anything intraoperatively to improve the situation, then you probably need it. So if there's doubt, you know, it's, it's a good adjunct. It takes 15 minutes and it can make a big difference. Um, I already said not hard. You can do it. Um, I think the easiest way to do it is just prone on the Wilson with fluoro, but you can do it just with surface landmarks and conscious sedation and lateral DQ. Uh, this is what the setup looks like. You know, you're obviously you're targeting the interlaminar space, um, and and you just kind of point and shoot until you get that brisk flow. I don't hey, think, Andy, I don't think your slides are advancing. Oh, really? You're still on or origin plan derotomy. Does everybody see that? Yeah, they're advancing for uh, for me. Oh no, I'm still on your other one. Oh, here we go. Look, I can flip through them. Never mind. Sorry about that. No problem, dude. How are you, Don? Dude, I'm great. Glad, Good. glad you're home being uh, Mr. Mom today. Yeah. Well, I have to go to the. I don't know. I have to go to the OR. It's, it's a tight. It's a little bit of a, a tightrope walk on Mondays. But okay. So um, target the interlaminar space. I'll get into the the kind of details of how to set this up probably on a case by case basis. Hopefully the fellows will get to do it with me once. Um, and once the drain is in place in you know, the protocol, usually it's two to three days, um, but you want to keep them flat. You can have like 15 degrees for head of bed for meals. Um, there's some debate about the rate. Like some people like to have it open and then like adjust the height of the bed to try to get like 10 cc's off an hour. The nurses generally hate that. It's super hard for them to do, particularly if the patient's not in the ICU. I'll just put them to the floor or put them on the floor and just have them like every two hours drain about 12 cc's. That's easy. And the nurses can do it. Um, and it just, I think, makes it a little bit less intense for all involved. Um, but I do keep them flat for that period. Um, there were a couple of incidences where lumbar drains were left open, leading to significant issues um, like herniation syndromes and deaths. So that led to the development of this thing called the limitor, which means that even if the nurse leaves the spinal drain open, it can't drain more than 20 cc's of fluid off without stopping itself. So that has made this whole process a lot safer. That is actually my last slide. So. Hey, Hanny, I got a question for you. Yeah. So let's say uh, you do a dural repair and it's not perfect and there's some leakage. And you're deciding, you know, whether or not, hey, you know, should I put in a lumbar drain? The question is, is like how much leakage, and I know this is hard to quantify, is is your threshold? Because, you know, sometimes we do a repair and like there's just a wee bit of leakage yeah. or, you know, sometimes a little leakage through the suture. Actually, where do you put, where do you pass your suture? It's like leaking around the edges of the suture just a little bit. Yeah. But you're like, you know, you know, you're like, okay, I think this is going to fly. You know, I don't need to do anything else. But then, you know, what what's your threshold for kind of how much leakage you, you're like, okay, you know, I need to just put a lumbar drain in and, and, and really take care of this. Yeah, I mean, I think if you've got a good primary closure and there's just like a little bit of leakage at the stitch site, you probably don't need to. My non-evidence-based like rule of thumb is if once I put the... Um, the sealant, like the dirt gin, the patch, and the sealant over it. If I've all solved and I'm still convinced that there's some leakage after that additional step, that's kind of when I do it. Um, so yeah, sometimes you'll see a little bit of fluid at the suture site. That I think is probably okay if you feel like you got a good closure. But if you do that and you put on the glue and you put on the patch and you still see some leakage when they've all solved, that's kind of when I will bite the bullet. And you know, it's I don't think there's one. That's not evidence based, and I don't know if there's a clear indication one way or the other but that's at least what i do gotcha. thanks man good talk yeah.